can you see my presentation by any chance not yet i can see that you are presenting but your presentation is not seen yeah okay just give me a moment i will figure it out for you for a second yeah now i can see oh now can you see yeah yeah you just ha huh, you can yeah per perfect yeah just a second can i just move this icon at the top which is quite irritating okay can you see the first slide which is the title slide is is that visible to everyone yes girls is it visible to all yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma great so yeah yeah i'll start now um thanks sir uh, sonu for the uh, for that introduction and um, i would like to again thank uh, dr bmn college uh, for inviting me today afternoon for this uh, online lecture on publishing in research journals i'm not sure uh, like how many of you have already started uh, you know looking uh, actually collecting you know your review for your literature review for your thesis if you've already started i'm sure you have seen some journal articles but those who have not ever seen what how a journal article looks like i'm sharing here two screenshots uh, i don't know if you can see it very clearly there are, there's one review article in public health nutrition and there's one in appetite uh, so these are two screenshots of the first a uh, page of the research article so the title in one journal is public and nutrition that's the title of the journal that means the name of the journal and appetite is another name of the journal if you see uh, in the public and nutrition there's something called written a review article so actually uh, journal publications include a lot of uh, i would say Say categories like one is a research article, one is a review article, one could be an editorial letter to the editor. So that's why I just shared two different examples. So this review article is actually a systematic review. Uh, there are different types of review. I'm sure you're going to learn about it. Maybe this year, maybe in your PhDs later on in life. It's a systematic review, narrative review, scoping reviews. Uh, we generally do a systematic review for a literature search, especially when you're doing a PhD, and it's a mandate in, a, particularly in Australia and U UK, that at least one paper in your PhD has to be based on a systematic review. So, just sharing a bit of this kind of information. Now, you just see the titles on the review article. The title of the this uh, paper is "Enablers and Blah Barriers," blah blah blah. Similarly, if you move on to the appetite paper, you have "Do you think adolescents' food intake is satisfactory?" and so forth. Just below the title, if you can see the name of authors are there. So, in first case, it's Ronto, Rati, Worsley, Sanders, Lonsdale, and Wolfenden. And similarly, in the other one, it's Rati, Riddell, Anthony, Worsley. And just followed by the authors, you have to see the, there are affiliations. First case, it's Department of Health Systems and Populations. Yeah, and similarly in the other one, it's Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition. So every author's affiliation is written. For example, if you girls write a paper, uh, write an MSc paper based on your dissertation, so and if you are still working at uh, Dr. B M N College. So your affiliation will be Dr. B M N College, Mumbai, India. And let's say you move to another university for a PhD, but still your paper uh, is based on your dissertation. Then I think your, I would say like uh, your affiliation will be, let's say S N D T Women's University. But your supervisor's affiliation will still remain the same, Dr. B M N College. So that's very critical. Now, okay, so. After this uh, affiliation, you will see both uh, in both these screenshots we have abstract. So this is a very important element of any research article. Very important element because based on this, the editor takes the decision whether this will go for peer review or not. I'll explain uh, you all about peer reviewing in the following slides. So abstract is very important. If you just look at public health nutrition. Uh, paper, the abstract has certain headings: objective, 
design, setting, participants. So this is known as a structured abstract. When I say what is a structured abstract, it means there are different subheadings given by the journal and you have to follow that guideline. Whereas if you move to the appetite screenshot, it's just a paragraph. So that's known as an unstructured abstract. This is absolutely depends on the journal guidelines. Whatever the journal says, you have to follow that. Now in appetite, you will just see under article info, we have keywords. There is adolescent, dietary behavior, teacher, parents, school, India. It's also there in the uh, review article, but I think uh, it's not covered in the screenshot. These keywords are very critical because they help in data searching. So maybe if uh, you did some work on adolescence, let's say in your MSc and you uh, published a paper, maybe five years down the line, somebody is looking for some paper in adolescence. So if you also have that word adolescent, so during that Google search, that word adolescent will of course be fed and that time maybe your paper comes up. And let's say if you had a teenager, so the chances for the word teenager becomes less, reason being it's a not such a common word. So try to have keywords which are commonly used uh, in the literature. And I think, yes, if you just go look at the appetite uh, screenshot, can you see on the other end, there's something written called the LZ words. It's a tree. Can you, I'm sure you can see that picture. So LZ word is actually a publication house. There are different publication houses which host these public you know, journal articles. LZ words is one. For public health nutrition, the publisher is Cambridge. We have others like Oxford. We have um, um, Emerald. We have Taylor and Francis. So these are the different publication houses. And it's very important because good publication houses generally host good journals. So you have to be really aware of the good publication houses. And just look at the public health nutrition uh, screenshot. You will see there's something written called the DOI at the top. Uh, it's written very small and there's a number followed by it. So DOI, the full form is Digital Object Identifier. I'm sure all of you are aware of this Aadhaar card, like every individual has an Aadhaar card. Similarly, every jo uh, journal article has a unique number that is DOI. So if you just feed, uh, feed this DOI in your Google Scholar or in your Google uh, portal, immediately that article is going to come up. So it's a unique identification number given to any journal article. Yes, now I believe I'll move on to the next slide. So as I told you, abstract is a very important element. Then we have the introduction. Some journals actually, instead of using introduction, they write background, so that's perfectly fine. So here you critically evaluate your literature, uh, like what's there, so you write down. What is missing, you write down. And why you want to do a particular research, you write down here. So the last paragraph of the introduction actually talks about your research questions A. Then you move on to write methods. Some journals write materials and methods. And they generally have a template uh, to follow, like research design and sampling. So in research design, I would say, like you have to mention that it's a cross-sectional design, whether it's an RCT, randomized control trial. If it's a qualitative study, you write that. What sampling technique you're using? For example, if you're using a... Uh, Mm, random sampling, uh, random stratified sampling, or you're using convenient sampling, or using snowball sampling, you write the details. You also mention I, uh, about the details about the sample, like who are your subjects? Are they adolescents? Are they teachers? Are they homemakers? Who are they? So that also has to be written. Uh, your setting, study setting is very important, like from where are you recruiting? Is it from rural area, urban area? So you have to write about all those details. Then what about the survey instrument? If you're doing a survey, so did you design the questionnaire? So you have to write the questions. If you're doing interviews, so you, uh, you will share your interview guide. Then you talk about data analysis. So which software did you use? SPSS data to analyze your quantitative. And if you're using qualitative, uh, like the interview in-depth analysis, then you use NVivo for thematic analysis. 
So yeah, so that will cover other methods. Just uh, if you can just look at that symbol there. So there's something called written the British Food Journal. So this is uh, an article uh, from British Food Journal. That's the name of the journal. And there you can see copyright Emerald Publishing Limited. So this is the publisher. And again, you can see that unique DOI for this article. Okay. Moving on to the next slide. Yes. Here we have results. Okay. In results, uh, so if you are doing surveys, of course, you'll put, because since you have numbers there, you put it in tables and you write a short paragraph about your results. But if you're doing qualitative, like in-depth interviews, um, then, you know, you, you don't have tables because you don't have numbers. You write them in, uh, I would say, uh, in paragraphs, like you uh, quote, uh, I would say, narratives from the participants, the interviewees. So that's about results. Be very careful. In results, never talk about other studies. It's your results. Just focus on your results. If you have graphs, you can put graphs. That also comes under results. You'll get different pie charts or whatever, bar graphs, whatever you want to have it there. Tables definitely are a major portion. But all that in quantitative research. For qualitative, it's a very different picture. Now we have done your results. We move on to discussion. It's now we're nearing the end of our manuscript the article. So here what happens, you could, so whatever literature you have cited in the introduction, against that, you critically evaluate your findings, whether your findings are similar to the uh, available evidence or are they contradictory, if they are contradictory. So you may give a reason. Perhaps this is the reason our findings are not similar to the previous or whatever it is. So you have to, you know, there should be a coherent argument, a logical and consistent uh, argument has to be done. Okay, now, uh, in the next slide, I talk about recommendation for research and practice. All journals don't have it, and generally in the behavior journals and the education journals. Sometimes uh, journals say you can embed this in discussion. Similar thing for conclusions. You may not have a separate heading for conclusions, you just write as a write conclusion as a last paragraph for the uh, discussion. Now, the last part of uh, your manuscript is references, bibliography. Okay, so whatever you have cited, whichever you know, whether it's book, comment reports, um, journal articles, all have to go in this references. Okay. So I think I've covered almost all the elements uh, of how a research article looks. So I'm sure if none of you have ever looked at it, once you look at it next time, it's not going to be very new or shocking to you. You will be quite similar with these terms. And I think it will be, it will be kind of an easy read for you. Now, uh, moving on, why do I need to publish my research in a journal? I can publish in the form of a blog. What's the problem? Put the blog, uh, put the link of the blog in Twitter, put the link in the blog in Instagram, put the link in FB. Everybody knows it. I may have a personal website that I can put up my blog. I can write a book. Then what's the need for a journal article? Everybody must wonder. You know, even I used to wonder until unless I came to know about these three reasons and why it's important. The first, it increases the credibility of the research. Now, how does that happen? Like, how can an article increase the credibility? The very important thing, when you submit an article in a peer-reviewed journal article, the reason being your article goes for review by experts in the field, in that area. So if there are any glitches, the reviewers are going to tell you that how to improve the article. If they think that the study design is quality, they're going to reject it. But whereas in a book or in a blog, there's no one to review it, no one to guide you whether it's right or wrong. So that doesn't have ethical importance. Therefore, uh, since peer reviewing is a key, and that is the reason publishing in an, a peer reviewed academic journal definitely increases the credibility of the research. Of course, uh, you know, increasing the credibility of the research is important. But similarly, it also increases your credibility as a researcher, as well as the institution you're working for. Now, let me tell you one thing. Uh, I don't know because since you are too young, uh, maybe once you apply for 
lectureship positions or PhD positions, and like maybe after PhDs, the first thing you will be asked: how many articles you have written or published in peer-reviewed journal articles? Because that's the currency. That's currency of any researcher. So, and that has the highest weightage. So whenever I apply anything, the journal articles carry the maximum weightage as compared to government reports, or books, as well as your, I would say, your blogs. So of course, and how does it help an institution? Of course, when you have more publications, the chances are that your institution can get grants, funding to do additional research. And finally, perhaps this is my favorite one, like. This was the one which actually I thought, oh, I should publish. It puts the knowledge in permanent searchable record. Even if you leave, leave this planet, like, like even if you don't have any existence, like once you are in heaven, still people will cite your papers. So this is the most, it's permanent. It's forever. Like how, you know, we talk about Taj Mahal, you know, we still remember Shah Jahan for it. It's, it's like, you know, memory. It's always going to be there. Similarly, a an article, I would say, you know, a research article in a journal will remain permanently until unless uh, it has been retracted because of uh, malpractices. Maybe you have dodged with the data or something. That's another part of the story. But yes, if you have done good quality work, there has been no cheating, no malpractices at all. This publication remains forever. So even if I'm not on this planet, surviving on this planet, still people can cite me. So I think this is one of the most, uh, like, I, I found it fascinating, the people remembering me, citing me. Yes, so now probably the next 13 or 14 slides, uh, like probably that's the main chunk of today's session, I would say. I will tell you how to write an article. I'll guide you, you know, different tips. Perhaps you, you, know, you may not know this because you're still very uh, in a nascent stage of your dissertation. And I think you should, if you get this information early on, this is going to be very handy for you. Because once your thesis is written, you can immediately jump on and start writing an article, I think. And anyways, I can always help in. And of course, Professor Mishra can also guide you in. Number one point, select an appropriate journal. So what's the good rule of thumb is to submit to the journals you read and cite most often. Uh, let's say, for example, we are working on nutrition education, like you want to do a dissertation on nutrition education, let's say. So you will read, you will do a literature review. Definitely you have to do, there is no option. Uh, so once you do a literature review, you will see most of the articles you are reading are either published in health education or it's in health education research or it's a journal of nutrition, education, and behavior. So at the back of the mind, you can, like you can gauge, okay, if I do this research, when I'm going to submit, I can submit in any of these because similar work has already been published in this kind of journal. That's one thing. It's easy way out. Then we have, uh, like suppose you are still not clear, like whether you can publish in those. So we have some websites which will actually help you to select the appropriate journal by either feeding in the abstract or title. For example, we have Jane. I'll just show you in the next slide how Jane looks like. And then we have the Elziva Journal Finder. They're different. I think for different publication houses, they're different public, you know, these journal finders. And of course, once you find the journal, you have to check the quality of the journal. So there are different parameters for checking that. One is impact factor. Impact factor, I don't know how many of you have heard this term, just letting you know it is the average number of citations of that particular journal. Just, uh, I don't want to confuse you and bog down with what is citation and all, like once you cite, like that's a citation. But just letting you know, generally nutrition journals have low impact factor because, you know, less work is done in our area as compared to chemistry, physics, medicine. So what happens, their uh, impact factors are quite high. For example, we have a nature medicine journal. It may have an impact factor of 40. A Lancet may have an impact factor of 30. Whereas our top journal in our category is American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, AJCN, which we say, it has an impact factor of six something. 
And uh, just I was sharing this appetite. Appetite has an impact factor of 3.2 something. Public health nutrition has an impact factor of 2.3 something. So you just, you know, you generally decide an impact factor. That's one. Another category is A, B, C, D journal ranking. So you're advised to submit an A category or B category. So both appetite and public health nutrition are in category A, whereas the British Food Journal, where I was showing the different elements, that's a B category journal. B category for nutrition, but A category for business. So, you know, it publishes in business, food business also. Of course, you need to know the publisher. So what happens, you should know which are good publishers. So good publishers are, as I just, I'm just going to repeat it, Emerald, Taylor Francis, Cambridge, Oxford, MDPI, Springer, okay, Elzevers. Not like Matara or Saraswati Publishing House, no. Please no. And lastly, I would say editorial board. Uh, so when you go to the journal website, you will see there's a list of editors. So that's known as the editorial board. The editors make the editorial board. So you have to see the, uh, and these edit editors are generally researchers and they hold quite good positions in universities. So you have to check which universities are the editors from. If they are from reputed institutions, then of course uh, you can submit it to that journal. And the most important one, be careful of predatory journals. There are many journals, like they're not peer reviewed, so they can be predatory, so never submit there. Some also ask for money uh, for publishing and they take the money and, and you know, they publish, but no, never submit that. Yes, there is a category called open access where you can submit, but that is different to predatory. So please be careful uh, of these predatory journals. Next slide. As I promised, uh, I wanted to share with you what is Jane. So Jane is journal author name estimator. So you know, once this uh, presentation is over, or if you still have the mobile phones, you can just type in this. And let's say, so you have decided you're going to write a paper, and you have the title in mind. So what you can do, you can feed the title in that Jane, uh, Jane feeder box. And then you can click uh, there, find journals. So it's going to give you a list of journals where you can submit your uh, article, uh, like appetite, public and nutrition. So, you know, these are the options which came. So I actually had written an abstract. So what I did was I more or less wrote my manuscript first draft, and then I wrote the abstract. And then I submitted it. Uh, I fed it in the J feeder. And what do I see is that... Uh, a list of journals came, Appetite, Public Health, BMC. So what did I do? I actually chose Appetite. And luckily, uh, Appetite accepted my publication. Otherwise, maybe I would have gone to Public Health Nutrition if that, was, that could have rejected. So it depends how you like how you select. Similarly, LZVers and all will also give you these journal finders. But the only problem with LZVers and all is it's a bit biased because they will only show you journals which are published by that publishing house. So like for nutrition, you have only two, like uh, appetite and food quality preference by Elzevers. Whereas Jane, it will give you all, like from different publication houses. Like appetite, I told you, uh, it's from Elzevers. Public Health Nutrition Cambridge. BMC Public Health is Springer. International Journal Environmental Research is from MDPI. Health Promotion International is Oxford. Nutrition Journal is Springer. So Ecology of Food and Nutrition is Taylor and Francis. So different publication houses, right? So J is kind of non-biased. So I prefer using J, but of course you can use others also, other web portals. Yeah, very critical, follow submission guidelines. So that is the thing, what happens is, I know that's why I say, you know, always, you know, first put in your title and have an idea, like which journal you're writing for. Because every journal has a different uh, guideline. It's never the same. Even if they are from the same publication house, the guidelines are different. So of course, every journal has citation guidelines and limits. Now what is Harvard? Yeah, Harvard is like, uh, so there are different ways of writing your references. So one is a Harvard way, another way is an APA style, the American Psychological Association style, one is MLA, one is Chicago style, so different. So how complicated Harvard is, 
you still have to follow Harvard because the journal is asking you to do that. If it says APN, then follow APN. Adhere to the word limit. If you exceed, what will happen is the editor is going to come back to you within a day, say, please shorten your paper and resubmit. And it creates a very bad impression. Now, manuscript work limit. Uh, generally between 3,500 to 6,000 work. But there are some journals, particularly open access and maybe appetite, which don't have any word limits. You can write as much as you want, but of course, it shouldn't be too lengthy. And keeping in mind the abstract word limit is between 2,000 to 300 words, 200 and 300 words. I'm very sorry for that. You know. Yes. Important. Who are you writing for? That's very important. See, I'm sure your, your work is just not meant for one audience. It's generally research work is interdisciplinary. Let's say you're working on nutrition education itself. So your target audience ranges from teachers, school teachers, college teachers maybe. If it's a nutrition education uh, for schools, of course, school teachers, maybe school principal. Curriculum planners like the, at the NCRT level, at ICSC level, like who design books, curriculums. So they, and researchers who work in nutrition education. So your audience is just not one. So you should know who I am going to target, who is going to be your target audience. You have to write accordingly. Interdisciplinary work uh, by definition needs to imagine and build its own audience. Make it clear upfront whom you're talking to and what you bring to the table. Right, moving on to the next one. Peer review is not problem solving. Now let me explain you what is first peer review, then I will explain you why it's not problem solving. So once you write a paper, you submit it to the, uh, you know, to the journal, and then the editor looks at the paper. If he is happy with the, he or she is happy with the abstract, he sends it for peer review. Peer reviewing is like, your paper is sent to two experts in that field. You may not know them, you may know them, that's another thing. And they are going to critically evaluate your paper. If they think there are good points, they're going to write that. If there are bad points, they'll tell you and they'll ask you for revision. So this process is known as peer review. Now, peer review is not problem solving. Why? What happens generally when we write a publication or a manuscript, we are very good till the results. We are written the instruction, uh, introduction methods, Results, but what happens? The most difficult is discussion, and you will face this problem when you write your thesis. Also, it's the most challenging part to write discussion. Let me tell you how you integrate, how you you know your your soundness of scholarship matters there, your citations, how you counter argue. It's very important. So generally, what happens? People get stuck and they say, "Oh my God, there's no time. I have to submit." Uh, like there's so much pending work, I have other papers to write, so I can't just sit on my discussion. So they just write one sloppy discussion and they submit. They think, okay, let me submit. Um, the peer reviewers are going to tell, uh, tell me what are the modifications. I can later on do it. And next time, definitely it will get accepted. Sorry, it's not the responsibility of the editor or the peer reviewers to break your impasse. Impasse is like your disagreement, your confusion. Okay, so if you're stuck, they are not going to help you out, sorry. What you can do is you can share your initial drafts, like draft four, draft five. You generally write 10 drafts, then only you'll you know, reach a good paper. But trusted friends or colleagues rather than journals. So let's say if you become a professor, you can share with other professor. But if you are a student, so you can share with another student, but be very careful. That's the reason I won't use trusted. I mean, there's so much fierce competition in academia nowadays that people actually um, may steal your data. So if you're sure that person is not going to steal your data, then only share, otherwise like, like at your stage, I would say your supervisors will be a good a choice to review. Anyways, they are going to review it for you. Okay, very important. There are three types of peer review. Double blind, single blind, and open peer review. So every journal guideline will tell you what peer review policy they use. Now, what does a double blind peer review? Double blind, I would say, is the most unbiased. Like, it's the best, I think, according to me. Though, like, I'm not saying others are bad, but I prefer double blind. So what happens when you write the manuscript? You don't write your name. 
and your affiliation. Nothing, no information revealing your identity is written, like and the manuscript is submitted. So, of course, you know, when the reviewers review it, uh, they send their comments back. So the reviewers also don't know your identity and you also don't know who the reviewers were. So you don't know who corrected it. So like public health nutrition has a double blind peer review policy. Now coming back to, sorry, going back now, coming next to single blind. Single appetite has a single blind peer review. Now what happens in single blind is, in your manuscript, you write your affiliation, you write your uh, names, and then you submit. So the reviewers know your identity, but you don't know reviewers' identity. You will get their comments, but their identity is never revealed. And in open peer review, similarly as a single blind, your identity is revealed to the reviewers since you're writing your uh, affiliation and everything. Whereas, uh, when the reviewers are going to submit their comments, you can also see their names. So BMC Public Health Nutrition Journal, they follow an open peer review policy. Is it clear? Okay, moving on to the next slide. Oh yeah, this could be frustrating. And this is not just for your journal article. This is for your thesis or dissertation. I don't know what you people call here. There are too many typos and grammatical errors in the manuscript to go ahead to peer review. Uh, how can I like, yeah, I would like to say like, you know, if you have too many typos and grammatical errors, it's actually really, you know, puts your image down in front of anyone, whether it's a supervisor or an editor. And you know, it can put off any reviewer or examiner, let me tell you. So always submit polished professional work. Careful proofreading is a must. It may seem obvious, but it doesn't always happen. Yes. How many times did you review? But you will see at the end, there's still one type of grammatical error. Uh, so yeah, of course, uh, for this, we need a fresh pair of eyes to look at the final draft in order to minimize typos and grammatical errors. What do I mean by fresh pair of eyes? Like a person who has never seen your draft. So if you have a good, you know, a very good friend who is in a, like studying English literature language, you know, and of course she may not steal your data at any cost, you can share your final draft with her, him or her, and just ask him or her to pick any typos or grammatical errors. And one more piece of advice here, which maybe many of, like many websites would t won't tell you, and even supervisors won't tell. It is very difficult to spot a typo on a computer screen or a laptop. But if you get a printout, it's easier to, you know, cite a typo and pick up an error. And this I'm telling out of my experience. I know, you know, taking printouts, it's waste of paper, but you have to do it because the journal articles are short. They're just 16 or 12 papers, but I think it's more easier to do that. I'll just share you an incident. I had my PhD thesis. It was around 736 pages. And my supervisors, both my supervisors gave me a green signal. Yeah, I mean, how you can go ahead and submit. But I don't know, I have this inner thing. No, there's something, you know, I still, you know, I think there are errors. So I took a printout. It was all free and all back in Australia. So I actually, but still, you know, I wasted 700 pages because that will not be bounded. Because it will be only be bounded after my thesis was examined. So what had happened was when I took a printout and I started you know, reading, I actually spotted 21 typological errors. And there were three sentences I still remember which were incomplete. And I could not spot it on the screen. So yeah, um, please make sure that you know you get a printout if it's necessary and you know read line by line. It, it's, it's much more you know, beneficial. Okay, now, of course, you do not just assume that copy editors, journal editors, peer reviewers will fix it for you. And of course, very important advice at this point. Let's say your paper is accepted and now it's ready for, uh, you know, publishing. So it's going to go to the copy editor. So they will also send you a final draft. So you also read that paper very carefully because any mistake there will remain forever. So be very careful at that stage too. Yes, uh, you need to sharpen your abstract, there's no doubt. You know, if the pictures, if the movie's trailer is not good, you don't want to see the movie, don't you? So if your abstract, abstract is not good, it's not attractive, I'm sure the editor would pass it on to the reviewers to spend adequate time polishing the abstract that you intend to submit with the manuscript. Abstracts are 
federal luton at the end I understood, then you write the abstract. Abstract should not merely represent the first five sentences of the manuscript. It should summarize the article or the whole. It should stand alone. Like if you read the abstract, you know what the study is all about. The abstract is actually manuscript's first impression. And first impression is last impression. Like if, if your impression is not good, you're gone. So definitely it should be snappy. And very important, don't include references. Never. How would the editor and peer reviewer assess your manuscript? So there are you know, three parameters on which uh, your article is reviewed. One is soundness of scholarship. So what does that mean? Uh, here, soundness of scholarship means like what kind of uh, literature do you have done? It's like what articles are you starting? Are they from books? Are they from government reports? Are they just from one article? Are they from 20 years old? Are they latest? Of course, your quality of style, how you write, and coherence of argument. It is like coherence means logical and consistent uh, argument, you know, or with the literature, evidence. Therefore, while preparing the manuscript for publication, one should keep his or criticism constructive, use professional and courteous language. Uh, yeah. You need to hook the reader. One needs to make the introduction immediately engaging to show why it's urgent at the outset. Ask your research questions, main questions up front. Explain how these are important questions you're asking or issues you're addressing. So your purpose, your research questions come in the introduction, as I told you in the starting slides. Note, this is very important. Identifying the knowledge gap. No one has just this, so I am, is never enough. This is a very common practice followed by you know, most of the students Perhaps I also have this, uh, you know, mindset. Okay, if nobody has done it, so I will do it. Fine, do very good. That's very good. Of course, research has to be known. But is that research relevant to the society? What benefits is going to do? So when I did my PhD work, uh, so I was asked this very simple question. Why do you want to do this work on school food policies and nutrition education? My supervisor just asked me a very simple question. It's nothing to do with writing. I said, nobody has done this, there's no literature. He said, that's fine, but why do you want to do it? So like for two minutes, I didn't knew the answer. Like I was thinking, I don't know why is he asking me this question? Like, I really don't know. I said, then I, I, then I gave the reason. I said, yeah, because there's, you know, obesity is on rise in private school children in India, and there is no policy at such. Even the curriculum is contradictory to the school food environment. Unhealthy foods are sold. So then he said, this is the reason that there is no policy available. The curriculum is contradictory to the school, so, uh, to the food sold in the school environment. So that's why this research is relevant to the society because it can benefit or it will help in the reduction of obesity. So this rationale is very important. Of course, nobody has done it very good, absolutely perfect. But why is it beneficial? You need to quote that. Yes, now again, coming back to that, uh, I would say, uh, coherence of arguments, soundness of scholarship, just, you know, a bit more clarification here. Yeah, you must justify your citational practices. Critical engagement is key, not mere, just don't cite, okay, this person sent it, it's done. Quoting those who support your argument, actual engagement and contextualization of scholarship is crucial. So you have to talk, okay, why there's not a policy, what do you think there has been a reason? What research has been done? It's kind of that. This includes how well the author has engaged with existing scholarship. That means uh, existing research articles or books, government reports. How up to date, all from 20 years ago, like are they all old articles? Are they all old citations, historically, or are they uh, from the last year? I always recommend a mixed pack. Like, of course, you do, you know, searching. If you just go to Google Scholar, they ask you to select that timeline. You want articles from 2018 to 2020. And I think it's uh, it's for other database portals also, like PubMed and all. So what happened, uh, you can put in the years. So I would say it should always be a mix. Like, you always should have something which has been done 10 or 15 years ago. And now what has been done in the last two or three years ago. 
The references are how extensive the research is. Is it all online? Like, did you take some from the books? All from one collection. So what happens? This, I think, uh, all of us have a tendency since we don't want to read a lot of articles. So we just try to have like 10, 20 articles and you're just citing them again. And again. No. Like I remember I had thousand research, uh, like thousand references, more than thousand for my PhD thesis. It was not limited to 20. Okay. Yeah. Until unless there's something you have, um, uh, which has never been done like this, something, nothing, that's fine. Then you can have 100 or 120. For example, like I'm working on COVID. So I really don't have many references, but still what I'm doing is me and my team, we're looking at ref, uh, at you know articles which were done in Ebola, you know, at the time of Ebola, because that's also why you know and you know infectious disease. What happens? Because we don't have anything on COVID. COVID never happened before. Okay, this never happened before. So that's the, you know this is the way how you you know counter argue and like okay, in in times of Ebola this was the case, but in COVID we see this. So you have to you know see how you utilize your literature well. And how they have incorporated a range of views, counter argument, existing criticism. For example, I don't know if you have heard about these feeling styles, authoritative, authoritarian, permissive. So um, there's literature uh, evidence which shows that authoritarian feeding style, you know, has a positive impact on food and vegetable consumption in children. Some articles show negative impact and some show no impact. So actually, you have to cite all these three and then create an argument. And then you can say, my article was similar to one of these. And then you say why it was similar. This is it. Yes, uh, how to structure the manuscript. Look at how others write. So of course, uh, you go to the journal web page, they will have a sample article. So you can look, have a look at it, how it's written. Since you know you will be reading so many articles for your literature review, you will get a hang of it. I think that's not a difficult thing. So have an idea how an article is written. Use a template and subheadings as given by the uh, journal guideline. Condense the background literature and move quickly into analysis. Methodology is explained and justified. Yes. This is the most easiest section to write, but you will get the maximum questions for peer review for this section. The problem is when, you, when it's too simple, you actually forget to write many things. Or maybe, uh, I don't know, some methods is the most, you know, you will get the maximum questions and methods for peer review. So methods have to be very clear. You should tell the audience like what you did, how you did it, how did you collect data, what analysis, it kind of that stuff. Now, data analysis should be relevant to aims and outcomes. Uh, if you are using uh, quantitative, so you should mention about the different tests, like if you are using a chi-square, if you are using a t-test, or whatever it is, a NOVA, whatever it is. But if you are doing qualitative, then you use thematic analysis. So there are different thematic analysis, template, uh, Nigel King's template analysis. So it should be appropriate to your aims, outcomes, okay? Conclusions are not just summaries. At the end of an article, you need to make sure that your reader leaves with a takeaway message, point, question. Rewrite, 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 edit, edit, edit. Uh, actually, this is less. I think rewrite should have been written six times and maybe edit four times. Uh, generally, a good manuscript uh, will easily take minimum five to six drafts or maybe 10 drafts like you know because since you know our uh, native you know our spoken language as such is not english because most of us speak you know our you know mother tongues maybe it's hindi gujarati marathi whatever it is so you know maybe you know we do not have such high command over english though we may have been taught in english but i still think we have that uh, deficiency to a bit so in our case maybe we need to write seven or eight drafts yeah but yeah, if you have a good flair of language, you have a strong command over your English, I think you will be comfortable with a sixth draft. How to structure the title? Connect the content. So it should be very clear, creative and destructive. And please mind you, not lengthy. Nobody likes lengthy title. There are journals which tell you even the word limit for title. I remember Health Promotion International 
has just 10 words for title. So your title should be in 10 words. Try to include keywords that come up on database searches, which I told you. So, you know, your keyword selection is very important. So that you have to be very careful. What happens once the manuscript has been submitted? So you've done, you know, you, you know, burned the midnight oil lamp. Now you have, you know, so much of, you know, all blood and sweat has gone into this manuscript. So what do you, like, what happens? What's the outcome? So, of course, your manuscript is submitted and it's considered by the editorial board. Uh, editorial board consists of editor-in-chief, deputy editors, associate editors and editors. Anybody can view your uh, article, any of them. So, first they will read your abstract. If they, hopefully, if it's not desrejected, desrejected means once they read the abstract, they think it's not right, so they immediately reject it within a day or so. Let's say it's not rejected. Uh, then what happened? It goes for peer review. Two or more peers. I think, I, uh, as of now, I think I've seen just three reviewers as of now. Three academic uh, reviewers. That's the maximum. Sometimes you only give one also and two. Uh, you may be asked to suggest some reviewers at the time of submission. However, it's not necessary that the suggested reviewers will be invited for peer review who are experts in the field of research. Some journals will ask you at the time of submission. Would you like to suggest any reviewers? So when you suggest, you have to be very careful that you have not worked with that individual for last five or seven years. Okay, like not worked in the sense you have not written any, not done any research, or you know, so that has to be critical. And they should not be from your same institution. For example, um, I can ask, I can suggest Laksh, Dr. Lakshmi Menon's name, your professor's name, because I've never worked with her. I did study with her, but it's long time back in 20, 2008 and 10. So now, like, oh, I have no contacts, I can cite her. But now it's the editor's choice whether they want to pick her up or not. But uh, if you just saw that public and nutrition abstract, it was Romantic Auto. I have you know, done a review with her. I'm, I'm doing a research work, COVID paper with her right now. So I can't cite her. Like, I can't suggest her name, not cite, sorry. I cannot suggest her name. So you have to be critical. And review process can take minimum, this is bare minimum three to six months, bare minimum. Yes, some open access journals generally give you in one month or 45 days, but they are very expensive. So if you have funding, then only you can uh, take open access. It's around one lakh rupees something. So yeah, it's not everyone's cup of tea. What are the possible outcomes of submission? So, you know, you have submitted what happens, of course. Uh, Except for publication without amendments, it is very, very rare. I haven't come across any such decision till date. Although it's an ideal outcome that you have submitted and there are no changes required. Like, you should be like just parting that all night, I think. Except for publication with editorial modifications, again, a very rare phenomenon. So the editor gives you the changes. I'm still to witness it. Okay. Then we have except for publication with a major or minor revision as suggested by reviewers. So reviewers will send you either it's a major revision or minor revision, they'll give their comments. This is a common favorable outcome. And if you have a minor revision, let me tell you, uh, girls, it's like one of the best thing. Yeah. So if you have minor, means the paper is written like it's of really good quality because that's the reason you never got a major revision. And reject. Test reject. Test reject is like the editor read your abstract, re immediately rejected it. Or it may get rejected after peer review also. Perhaps the most common outcome, nevertheless, it could be quite disappointing. Yeah, of course, naturally, nobody will be pleased with this outcome, uh, no doubt about it. So now what next? I have been rejected. I'm not worthy. Never think so. Don't take this rejection as a sign of your worth as a scholar. I'll tell you why. Because maybe this journal was better, uh, you know, perhaps it, this article was better suited for another journal. Of course, make judicious use of the referee reports. So if you've got some rejection, you know, after peer review, incorporate, you know, uh, modify your paper, include the suggestion and then resubmit it. I'll tell you one story. Uh, it's based on my paper itself. So there was a, uh, once I was finishing my PhD, uh, like it was in my, on my last stages of PhD, 
uh, so I put in a paper in around 2017 on nutrition education. Okay, so I submitted uh, that paper. It got best rejected thrice. So I was thinking, like, what's wrong? Am I not writing? Like, I'm not submitting the right journal. The fourth time they said that, like, we didn't find the reviewer. So it got, like, they retract. They asked me to uh, take out the paper. Fine. Fifth time I submitted, I got a peer review. It was a mix. One was one said minor, one said reject. Anyway, the paper got rejected. So I included that suggestions. Sixth time, again a test reject. So my supervisor said, Neha, you already have so many papers. Just forget about it. It's too much you have done. Like because again and again when you submit, you have to again and again modify the citation and all. So it could be in a way time consuming and challenging. I said, no, Tony, uh, I think the paper is well written. Perhaps, you know, I'm not choosing the right journal. There's somewhere something going wrong. And I have this gut feeling, you know, that you know, I always have this, uh, I always share the same. The cat has line, nine lives. Similarly, you should at least try nine times. So seven times I submitted this paper to health education. I had submitted early also, like, uh, like my other two papers, but this was the first time I'm submitting this paper to health education. Luckily, I just got minor revision, so that means my paper was well written, it showed. My mistake was I was targeting the wrong journals. I know it's not a very high category journal, it's a B category journal, but no problem. No issues. It's a good journal, it's a double blind, it's by Emerald, good publication house. So yeah, so any is it got accepted in 20, uh, published in 2019, so I had a very long wait for that. But yeah, so my message is always resubmit. Never keep it, never. Until unless, you know, the, I would say your study design is faulty and it's really a bad standard paper, then it's, yeah. Now, I'll end this, uh, end this presentation with this uh, phrase, which was originally coined in an academic journal way back in 1928, publish or perish. This phrase has actually become a harsh reality now. There's so much of competition, but if you don't publish, you are not going to survive in academia. So what has happened because of this, there's too much of you know, negative vibes where you know, there's duplication of results. People are you know, doing that similar research, salami slide saying. So I just want to tell you, don't fall for this phase. Yes, it's important to publish, but it's more important to do good quality research. If you have done good quality research, you did a good high standard, a high, quality, high standard paper, nobody is going to to stop you from getting it published. Yes, of course, there is pressure to get a good academic position. You need good quality papers, but I think few is also enough. But of course, if you have many good quality papers, uh, there's no harm in doing that. But yeah, uh, don't take this phrase very seriously. Uh, like, Don't be harsh on yourself. Do good work and publish good quality papers. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a detailed presentation and sure students much have benefited and I'm so very happy like they got to know about these topics and these points well before their thesis before they are completed and they when they are going to publish they have got all the information at the right time. Thank you so much. Neha. Student do you all have any doubts please? Yeah. Uh, Neha, there are yes, I can see Nikita Singh asked me a question. Yes, uh, I can see Nikita. <laughs> okay, yes, Rina. Uh, let me answer first. Uh, Nikita, uh, will that be okay? I'm just. Uh, uh, Neha, you can I... click on the chat box and you can read all the chats. Yes, yes, yes. I'm just looking at yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, probably, you know, to uh, talk about narrative review and a systematic review, Khyati, I will need another session. So it will be very difficult to tell you. But systematic review is more comprehensive. I can say in one word. Whereas a narrative review is a general review, which we generally do for our literature search. Okay? That is one point. But of course, uh, there's a you know, we need one entire session to discuss a systematic review. It's one of the best rated reviews uh, in, you know, in, I would say in scientific arena. Okay. Oh, sorry. My voice was cracking. I'm very sorry. I don't know. Uh, that's charming. I think it was hardly for a second or two. I don't think it was for a long time. Ma'am, I oh, think okay. it was my 
कनेक्शन प्रॉब्लम ओके ओके आई एम वेरी सॉरी जान बी इफ आई वाज या हाउ कैन वी आइडेंटिफाई प्रेडेटरी जर्नल्स या वेरी गुड या दिस इज अ गुड क्वेश्चन सो यू जस्ट गो टू द जर्नल्स वेबसाइट ओके सो व्हेन यू गो टू द जर्नल्स वेबसाइट व्हाट हैपेंस यू लुक एट द एडिटोरियल बोर्ड लुक एट द इंपैक्ट फैक्टर व्हिच एजेंसी इज गिविंग इंपैक्ट फैक्टर इफ द एडिटर्स आर फ्रॉम गुड प्लेसेस लाइक फ्रॉम कॉर्नेल फ्रॉम कोलंबिया देन इट्स नॉट अ प्रेडेटरी जर्नल ऑफ कोर्स लाइक सम यूनिवर्सिटी व्हिच आई हैव नेवर हर्ड ऑफ then of course that's something wrong if they are asking money for you to publish let's say if it's not open access then it's something not okay if they are saying there will be no peer review then it's not a good journal so these, there are a lot of signs to tell you about this reena says ma'am at msc level in which journals can be published yeah and it depends uh, yeah i know aiming for an a is a bit uh, difficult But you can definitely go for B. But see, if your work is like in clinical nutrition and all, I know aiming for an American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, it's like too ambitious. But still, uh, we have other journals like you can up uh, for clinical nutrition, right? Which maybe you can try nutrients, but that's an open access, so you don't have one lakh rupees to you know get that paper published. Hmm. I have to figure it out. Uh, I really, I'm not, uh, you know, so much into clinical nutrition. So I have to check care, you know, like I have to, you know, check it out and let you know. And yes, you can definitely try if it's just normal nutrition publications. British Journal is a good option. It has a factor one point two, and it is a B, and it's a good journal. You can publish there. Uh, journal of Nutrition Education Behavior is good. That's uh, A category, so that's good. ओके व्हाट यूजीसी अच्छा यूजीसी केयर जर्नल्स या या सो दी दिस यूजीसी केयर जर्नल इज अ लिस्ट ऑफ जर्नल्स अप्रूव्ड बाय यूजीसी सो दैट लाइक दे सो या यू कैन एक्चुअली फाइंड अ प्रेडेटरी जर्नल सो एंड इफ इफ यू थिंक यू हैव अ डाउट इट्स अ प्रेडेटरी जर्नल यू कैन चेक दिस लिस्ट ऑफ यूजीसी केयर जर्नल्स इफ अ जर्नल नेम इज नॉट देयर दैट मींस इट्स अ प्रेडेटरी जर्नल So UGC Care will generally have all the top publication, uh, top journal names. So the names which I took now, starting from Appetite, Public Health, Nutrition, Health Education, H Health Promotion International, BMC, Public Health, they are all listed under UGC Care journals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome, Nikita. Welcome. Yeah. Any other doubts, girls? Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Girl, this is the right time. If you need to ask any questions related to publish uh, publication, please ask, ma'am. Yes, no. <laughs> I always ask them. At least reply with a yes or no, so that I understand. Oh, uh, Jani, yes. Uh, I think uh, Sonu can forward my email ID to you. Yeah. I'll forward it for sure. Yes, ma'am. Could you please repeat the name of the British journal you just said? Yes, it. I'll write it for you so that my. Uh, if you have any issues. Yes, sir. Ma'am, so all these journals are paid? No, no, no. British food, you don't pay. No, you don't pay. But that's one thing. One one thing I would like to add, though I've never done that because you know I've always published from Australia. since you guys are from india i'm also from india i'm not saying i'm from australia but my phd was based in australia you can just write to the editor that you know i am from a lower middle income country and i am a student can you waive off my publication charge that is for open access okay i'm getting it so but british food journal no charges appetite no charges public health nutrition no charges no charges. There are very few who take uh, which are open access. One is Nutrients, one is Nutrition Journal, BMC Public Health. So you don't have to submit there. My university had a lot of funding, and you know we we you know we had the privilege of submitting. The advantage of submitting in open access is which you will uh, is you get more citations because everybody can see it. Whereas a British Food Journal is a closed journal. That means until unless your college library or university library has an access, you will not be able to see that publication in total. You can only see the abstract. So this is between closed access and open access. But for open access, you have to pay a lot. 
and that I don't think Indian universities. I, I'm not sure about it, so I'll not be able to comment much on it. I don't think you have funding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Rina. Thanks. Yeah. I think they are done with the question. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> but as and when they will actually start with their publishing and all, they might have some questions. So oh yeah, yeah. Any time, just get back to me over my email. I'm uh, of course uh, I'm to ha uh, help you out. I'm not sure like whether I'll be able to help you out with your methods and all because I'm not a clinical nutrition person. But that I'm sure your supervisors and guide will take care of you. Uh, yes, with regards to publishing, where to submit, what to do, you can definitely come. Or maybe I can do another session with all of you. A similar one, like if you can tell me, ma'am, you know, most of us of you are submitting in a particular journal, then we can just go through the guidelines of that journal one day. Yeah, thank you. That would, yeah, I think that would be much better and convenient for all of us. Yeah, so thank you so much, Nia, for the beautiful session. So, on behalf of this ride, I thank you for taking a uh, wonderful session, and uh, surely we'll get back to you if you'll have any doubts. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yes. Uh, just one request: if you can just uh, stop recording and share the recording yeah, link. Sure, I'll share the recording once I get the recording in my mail ID. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank